morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, 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 welcome. Welcome to episode 55 of McCray Live. The day today is Thursday, May the 14th, 2020. It's 11.03 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, thank you for joining me today. I want to talk about Harrison Ford's best movies, but there is a... There's a criteria here. There's, there's, I, I have intellectualized this. I have thought about this. So, um, yeah. So I'm going to break down sort of how I am approaching this. And then I will get into Harrison Ford's uh, top five best movies. At least what I think are probably his best movies. Now, uh, let me say this. Yes, uh, some of you may notice. I see Dave, you look like blue Halloween. Like Halloween, uh, good morning. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying out some new lighting uh, behind me. I have also ordered uh, a few new lights uh, from Amazon, which should be... Um, uh, should be here uh, probably in the next week or so. And of course, that was purchased with the money raised through the channel uh, from all the super chats and things like that. So um, not, I mean, these lights are fine that are on either side of me here, but I wanted some mood lighting. I wanted to sort of accent the background a bit better. Uh, and right now I have a few lights that I already had in my sort of uh, lighting kit that I have set up, but I ordered a couple of more uh, to that are going to accent the background behind me. And then I'll use the ones that I ordered along with the ones that I currently have that are sort of set up at the moment. And just to kind of give some, some, you know, just to kind of make it a little more interesting and a little, I found, uh, although it was lit really well, I found that uh, it was sort of, you know, a little too uniform, maybe kind of spiced up a little bit. I know some people, when they get on the tube, they tend to kind of, you know, accent their background. I thought, you know what? I, yeah, yeah, I like that. Some look better than others. And right now, this is sort of a preliminary kind of thing, and and uh, uh, I'm just waiting on uh, the other lights to arrive to make uh, my background a little more sort of uh, fun. And of course, you know, uh, many different colors. So I can have the background kind of a blue right now. I can have it red, green, yellow. I can have it festive for Christmas if I want to, <laughs> you know, whatever, right? Um, so that's why you probably have noticed a bit of a difference uh, in the uh, in the, the lighting in the background is because it is a little blue. But as you can see, it's kind of blue over here, but then it kind of tapers off a little bit over here. It's because I got to get some more lights and they have been ordered. And it's thanks to you guys for making that possible. Like I said, everything raised through the channel goes right back into the channel and making uh, the show. So, um, you know, more interesting and fun and, and uh, yeah, all that kind of juicy shit. So top five Harrison Ford movies. Okay, so how am I, what is my approach to this, right? What, what am I doing? Well, first of all, let me say I am a, um, oh, oh, God, we got this guy in here. Oh, God. Uh, anyway, we'll just do this. There we go. And there we go. Okay. Mr. Uh, Tony Michael has been hidden from the, uh, from the, uh, um, from the conversation. That wasn't Tony, by the way, folks. You'll know if it's Tony because you'll see his little avatar. And Tony's also a moderator on the channel. So, uh, yeah. So, so anything other than Tony, the moderator with the little wrench isn't Tony. Uh, anyway, let's move on. So, um, and I, I thank you to my uh, moderators uh, for catching that. Uh, great stuff, guys. So, um, so yeah, so for those of you that don't know, Harrison Ford is my favorite actor. He's been my favorite actor since I was five years old. I don't necessarily think he's the best actor. I mean, he's not bad. He's, he's, he's fine. But I'm, I'm not saying like he's like Daniel Day-Lewis or Robert De Niro or Al Pacino. But he is my absolute favorite actor of all time. And you've heard me say this a thousand times when I was uh when I was uh in kindergarten I had these dark blue pants with a red stripe down the side that I used to call my Han Solo pants. They weren't Star Wars pants. They just happened to be dark blue pants that had a red s stripe down the side. I mean you, you could totally say that they were police officer pants too, you know, or something like that. But uh, but in my mind they were Han Solo pants, right? So, um, a huge Harrison Ford fan. I mean, I, I, he, he was born on July the 13th, 1942. Uh, he's got about 83 movies, I think it is, in his filmography. Uh, I remember reading his biography as a kid. That is something I did read because I don't read a lot of books, but it, that I read. I read his, his biography and right from the beginning to the end and why he went to 
drama school and why he chose L.A. instead of New York to, you know, he flipped the coin with which way to go. I, I, I know I, a lot about this man. And, um, and he's my favorite actor of all time. And he's up there now. He's 70. He'll, he'll be 78 this year. And I know that, you know, I'm, that's going to be a, when he goes, and he will eventually, obviously, because he's getting up there in age, that's going to be a tough day for me. That's going to be tough. I mean, that will probably be, funny enough, the toughest day next to after my parents passing away in 2011. Because he's, I've just, I've idolized this guy. Not idolized. That's too too strong of a word, but he's been my favorite. He, he's such a big part of my childhood. You know, I used to watch his movies all the time on repeat, you know, whether it was Star Wars or Indiana Jones or, I mean, Jesus, you know, I even had like Frantic in there and, and he, he, he's got so many movies, a lot of movies that a lot of people haven't even heard of great movies that he has starred in or that people have forgotten about like, Oh Yeah. And as you guys know, I like to challenge myself and do top five lists instead of top 10. You could do a top 20 with Harrison Ford. Easily, easily do a top 20. Oh my God, he's one of the most iconic actors in the history of motion pictures. Absolutely, you could do a top 20. But I like to challenge myself, as you guys know, with the other top five lists on my channel and really sort of, you know, kind of see if I can come up with his five best. Well, how do you come up with five Harrison Ford movies? Because you're going to leave somebody off. I mean, you're going to, I mean, I'm not going to mention something and somebody's going to go, yeah, but what about? And you're not going to be wrong. And then I'm not, and, and then I'll, you know, okay, I'll include that. But then somebody else is going to be like, yeah, but what about? And it's like, yeah, you know what? You're right. I mean, he's got that much of a prolific career, obviously. So how do I approach this, right? Well, you know, I will have a couple of honorable mentions, you know, and honorable mentions are just really excuses to extend lists, you know. Top five with three honorable mentions, so it's a top eight. <laughs> you know what I mean? Top 10 with four honorable mentions. Okay, so it's a top 14. I mean, really, at the end of the day, I think honorable mentions are kind of just the excuse to kind of say, hey, you were good too. You, you were good, but... You know, anyway, I will have a couple of honorable mentions, but the way I'm approaching this is this. So... I'm not going to include the four Indiana Jones films on a top five list. I might include one, right? And pick the one that I feel is the best, right? Because they're all the same, right? So you're not going to, you know, and, and again, I'm trying to be as objective as I possibly can, removing my subjectivity of the love of certain films and kind of look at his career and pick out what are the quintessential Harrison Ford movies, do you know what I mean? You know, movies that, that you, you know, and if, it's, and if it's part of a series, you pick one. You know, you don't pick both. You know, you don't pick three or four. You pick one because you don't need to pick the rest, you know, because it's sort of self-explanatory that, okay, that's, you know, that's part of all this, right? So, and again, we're talking about his best movies. What make him as an actor shine what make him whether it's the stereotype that people think of when they think of Harrison Ford or whether it's the the you know the uh uh his his best performance as an actor right um that's sort of where I'm thinking you know I'm, I'm trying to be as objective as I possibly can but even my bias might seep in a little bit because you know it's Harrison Ford this is like like my second dad <laughs> You know what I mean? For a lot of us young boys growing up in the 1980s, it kind of was like that. So uh, that's my mindset. I will get to your super chats. Don't worry, but I'll get to them after. Uh, so I've written it down in typical Dave McRae fashion. No graphics, no, you know, top five intro or anything like that. We're doing it down and dirty, old school style. Um, and this is, not really in any particular order per se, uh, but certainly the f I think the first one is. I think number one definitely is. Um, so number five, when you think of Harrison Ford and you look at his career, you know, he is, like I said, arguably one of the most prolific. And when I mean prolific, I mean, I I'm taught a, a bona fide movie star. You know, we don't get movie stars anymore, you know? We don't get those classic, 
Do you know, like, I remember, and it's not that I'm that old. I mean, I'm 41, essentially. I'll be 41 in like a week. So, but the fact of the matter is that I remember a time when we used to go to the movie theater to see a specific person. You know, like you would go to see a Harrison Ford movie. Do you know what I mean? You would go to see a Spielberg movie. Um, I, I remember, and I'm going to paraphrase this, but I remember when the trailer for Six Days, Seven Nights came out, which was a Harrison Ford movie with Anne Hayes in 1998. And it was a, it was a, I think it might've been a television spot. And this is going back 22 years. And I remember the, uh, the voiceover for the trailer said something to the, again, I'm paraphrasing all this, but said something to the effect of, um, you know, uh, something like, um, like he's, you know, he's the guy you've been waiting for or, or something like that. And Harrison, F and then it cuts to a shot of Harrison Ford in the movie, turning to Anne Heche and saying something like, that's my job. You know, something like that. And what that was all doing was it was playing off of the fact that we were still kind of in a, an era and a time where that's why you went to the movies. You, 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 you're, you're going to see him. You're going to see him. Now, obviously, you hope the movie's good, of course. But that was st that was sort of like the, the tail end of an era where where people went to see movie stars. I mean, they went to the theater to see these actors in these movies. Now, I mean, it's so saturated and, and it's not that we don't have stars, but it just seems like everybody's bleeding into each other and there isn't like a, a real, you know, and you can say, what about The Rock? Well, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I guess, I guess, but he's a different kind of star. Um, but but that but the, that would be like the closest to what it was like through the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. I mean, you you went to see these 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 stars, you know, and Harrison Ford is one of the last, you know, you could put Tom Hanks up there as well. Harrison Ford is one of those last movie stars, you know what I mean, that 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 helped to change cinema. So so when I think of Harrison Ford in his top 5 films, this is uh number 5 for me would be The Fugitive. And I say The Fugitive because that when that movie came out, it was huge, 1993. Obviously, a movie version of the television show from the 60s, I think. I think it was the 60s. Um, and this was a great movie. Tommy Lee Jones, I think, if I, I stand to correct it, but didn't Tommy Lee Jones win the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for that movie? He was nominated at the very least. I think he won. I think he won, if memory serves. Um, but a great movie. And... It encompasses really, it is the perfect example that really encompasses a lot of what Harrison Ford as an actor brings to the table. So Harrison Ford has, again, I'm not saying he's the best actor in the world, but he has a, there's a vulnerability to Harrison Ford, right? There's a, there's a sweet shyness to Harrison Ford's character. And he brings that to a lot of the roles that he's in. There's a, there's a, there's a shyness, there's a vulnerability to him. And you see that in The Fugitive, right? Because he's a man that's been wrongfully accused. But you also get the aggression side of him, right? The passion, the determination to prove his innocence, right? So you get that kind of side of him. And then you get a bit of the action side in there as well. I mean, it's not like Indiana Jones action, but you, you certainly get some action sequences in there, right? Where he's being like, you know, your typical kind of Harrison Ford. Um, so and it was and it was a great movie. I mean, it was you know it had a great cast, a great ensemble. Tommy Lee Jones. Anybody uh, get off my plane? Yeah, Air Force One. Um, so yeah, so so that for me was that's why it's my number five. Is that it, it's sort of it's it's a, it's a great movie, and it's got a great cast, and but it is it is again a quintessential Harrison Ford movie. You know, you look at the role. Not that anybody else couldn't have played it, but. Again, you, you, you see a lot of the a lot of the Harrison Ford isms and, and a lot of the things that he brings to a lot of the roles that he's he, he does are very apparent in The Fugitive. And it works. It works for that kind of character. You know what I mean? And uh, and it's a great movie. So that's my number five. My number four. And again, this is no I mean, you can exchange you can you know rearrange these in order, except for number one. I think one really is is the quintessential Harrison Ford film. Uh, number four for me. And again, I just want to say this, 
These are not, I mean, I'm trying to be as objective as possible, right? I'm not, I'm not just throwing popular Harrison Ford movies out there. I'm really thinking about this in terms of the, the actor and what we think of when we think of Harrison Ford. Um, number four for me would be What Lies Beneath. And the reason why it would be What Lies Beneath is because this is, it's a great movie directed by Robert Zemeckis, of course. I always have to say this because I just think it's so interesting. He, of course, I mean, Robert Zemeckis, one of the greatest directors of all time, Back to the Future, What Lies Beneath, Castaway, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Forrest Gump, you know, I mean, this is, you know, uh, uh, Romancing the Stone, um, you know, in, incredible career. Um he directed the first half of Castaway. Then the the crew, that same crew, went while Tom Hanks was supposed to lose, you know, 60 pounds, which he did. So he took like, you know, seven, eight months to do that. The same crew that was shooting Castaway went and shot What Lies Beneath. And then after that was done and Tom Hanks lost, you know, 50 pounds or, you know, whatever it was, they went back and shot the rest of Castaway. And I just remember thinking, woo! Ooh, that's intense, man. Even Robert Zemeckis was like, yeah, we'll never do that again. That was way too intense, way too intense. And, and very jarring creatively to take your mind off of one project and dive deep into another and then come off that one and dive deep back into the other one. It was very sort of, it was a weird kind of thing. Anyway, What Lies Beneath came out in the year 2000, grossed about $150, $155 million at the box office. Michelle Pfeiffer, of course, is in it. A great suspense supernatural thriller. And uh, this is a movie, spoiler alert if you haven't seen it, but, you know, for God's sakes, I mean, it's been 20 years. Um, Harrison Ford is the bad guy in this movie. Now, you don't know that. You might suspect something kind of along, you know, along the way, but he turns out to be the villain, so to speak. And that was a great role reversal for Harrison Ford. Great role reversal for Harrison Ford. Uh, because we are so used to seeing him as that the guy in The Fugitive, right? You know, the vulnerability, the sweetness, the the wronged guy, the innocent man, you know, and he wasn't so innocent in What Lies Beneath. And so that was a great role reversal for him. I have no doubt that that is partially, if not the sole reason why he took it. And uh, it's it's got to be on there because when you watch, if you were to watch every other Harrison Ford film, if nobody had... If somebody didn't know who Harrison Ford was and you were introducing them to Harrison Ford, you would want to show that movie because every other movie he's playing the other guy, right? You know, some version of a hero or an anti-hero. So you want to be able to kind of show them a movie like What Lies Beneath because it's like, oh, and he he's the, now he's this guy. It's, oh, the, well, well, that's interesting. It's different, right? It's different. And uh, so that's why uh, it's my number four. Uh, my number three is arguably one of my favorite Harrison Ford movies of all time. I don't think it gets enough credit. I don't think it gets enough uh, uh, recognition. I think it's a, it's a great performance by him uh, when we're talking about his, him as an actor, because, you know, again, Harrison Ford is, is, will never go down as one of the greatest actors of all time. I'm not saying he's a bad actor. I'm just saying he's not up there with, you know, your Pacinos and your, you know, Daniel Day, you know, Lewis's, right? But, but he is, he is, he's an action guy for all intents and purposes. And, but this movie he did in 90, what was it? Hang on a sec here. It was 90, one, I want to say 91. Uh, da, 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 91, yeah. This movie he did in 1991 was terrific. And uh, uh, I'll give you a little hint. It was obviously, uh, it was written by or partially written by. Uh, was it written by or partially written by? Do, 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 do. I think it was written by. Yeah, yeah, it was just, yeah, he was the full writer on it. Was uh, written by J.J. Um, Abrams, which of course is 1991's Regarding Henry. If you guys haven't seen Regarding Henry and you want to see a movie where Harrison Ford brings the goods in terms of his acting ability, you got to watch Regarding Henry. It is essentially the Cliff Notes version. I think he's a lawyer, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he's a hot shot kind of guy, right? Who uh, goes down to a convenience store one night to buy, I think, a pack of cigarettes or something. There's a robbery. He gets shot in the head. And obviously there's brain damage. And the rest of the movie is about him recovering and sort of rediscovering, you know, his family and his marriage and how things were not perfect in his marriage. I mean, you know, there was a lot of 
shit going on. And, and uh, it's sort of the rediscovery of that. He becomes a totally different person. He's, he becomes more of a simple person person because obviously there is brain damage and he has to learn how to speak again he has to learn how to move his hands again and talk again and all that kind of stuff i mean it was a really good performance now i mean again it's a 1991 movie so the movie might seem a little dated to some of you but it's a great performance and uh i don't know who was nominated for academy awards in 92 because obviously it's always the year afterwards uh you know, when I look at the actors who were nominated for Best Actor in 92, I might be like, oh, yeah, no, no, that makes sense why he wasn't nominated. But certainly, I mean, it's a, it's a hell of a performance, and it was one of his best since another movie that's on this list, which is next, which is my number two. But if you guys haven't seen Regarding Henry, you've got to see Regarding Henry. Again, I'm approaching this list as Harrison Ford's best movies not what's popular not what the pop culture necessarily says you should like or what the pop culture says is popular i mean that's easy empire you know indiana jones you know blade runner you know and it's not that those wouldn't be on here or maybe maybe a couple aren't on here but i'm saying it's not it's not that cut and dry i mean there's a lot of films you guys probably haven't even heard of like you know frantic or uh you know um i think he was even in the conversation or you know the frisco kid or like there's a lot of movies you guys probably like what uh, you know what i mean so i i don't want to just go to what's popular i want to go to sort of what are his best you know um what are really good harrison ford movies that kind of showcase the quintessential archetype of what we think of when we think of harrison ford and there's no doubt that some of those popular movies are on here i mean they have to be right but anyway but but so so five is the fugitive for the reasons i said four is what lies beneath for the reasons i said number three is regarding henry for the reasons i said and number two is arg arguably the best movie he's ever done arguably arguably my favorite Harrison Ford movie, a movie that doesn't get an enough recognition, a movie that I think was ahead of its time when it came out in 1986, I believe. Let me just uh, make sure of that. Uh, 86, yeah. And like I said, arguably ahead of its time, stars the late, great River Phoenix. It is the Mosquito Coast. This is a drama. This is essentially about Harrison Ford, essentially, without giving too much away. He plays a um, he plays an inventor. He's a he's a genius. His name is Ali Fox. I think it's Ali Fox. Make sure. I haven't watched the movie in a little bit. It's Ali Fox, right? Da da da. Yeah, Ali Fox. So uh, you know, and he lives in, you know, a town or whatever, you know, with his family. And he's sick of life. He's sick of the world. He's sick of the bullshit. He's sick of the hypocrisy. He's sick of, you know, he's he's dry, you know, at the beginning of the movie, he's driving around in his pickup truck with his son, played by River Phoenix, which, ironic, not ironically, coincidentally, a few years later, River Phoenix, of course, would play young Indiana Jones at the beginning of The Last Crusade. Um, but he he's he he he's had it. He's absolutely had it with life and the bullshit and the fucking hypocrisy and all that kind of shit, right? So what does he do? Again, I'm cliff noting this. He just he he buys a uh, a town. He buys a town in some like deserted. I don't know. Is it in? I think it's South America or some like in the Amazon and the jungle. I think it's South America. Um, anyway, he buys like you know, and he buys this town. He becomes like the mayor of this town. But when he moves, he uproots and moves his family to this deserted fucking in the middle of the Amazon jungle bullshit. There's nothing there. It, it's nothing. It's just like jungle and bullshit. But he's like the you know, he's like this is great. This is amazing. We can build this and do this because he's an inventor, right? And anyway, the the I won't give too much away. But I'll just say that the irony of the story is, is that he he eventually becomes what he's trying to escape. And it was a brilliant performance. River Phoenix is fantastic. Helen Mirren plays his wife. The two little um, redhead twins from uh, The Great Outdoors with John Candy and Dan Aykroyd, you know, those two redhead twins. They're in the movie as well, uh, playing his uh, two young uh, twin daughters. Um, they don't say much, just like they don't say much in the great outdoors, but uh, they're cute. Um, and, and it's great. It, like you guys, if you guys haven't seen the Mosquito Coast, you've got to see the Mosquito Coast. It is probably arguably Harrison Ford's best performance he's ever done. And if if I'm not mistaken, this is 
I believe in an interview, he's also said that it was his favorite movie he's ever done. And the movie, I believe, was directed by Peter Weir, who also, I just want to make sure here. Uh, where are we? Mosquito Coast, directed by, I think it's Peter Weir. Yes, it's Peter Weir, who also directed Witness, of course, which is another great Harrison Ford movie as well. So uh, so that's my number two. So again, my number five is The Fugitive, for the reasons I said. Number four is What Lies Beneath, for the reasons I said. Number three is Regarding Henry, for the reasons I said. Number two is The Mosquito Coast, for the reasons I just said. I mean, you, you guys have got to see The Mosquito Coast. And number one, the number one Har- quintessential Harrison Ford movie that sort of encompasses everything. The vulnerability, the shyness, the sweetness, the action, you know, the uh, the one-liners, the quips, you know, the dry sort of, you know, he, he's handsome, you know, he's, he's that, you know, I almost just gave it away there. Uh, no doubt is in my opinion, uh, the first Indiana Jones movie. It's Raiders of the Lost Ark. I I mean, that is, not only is that the best of the four films, it is, it is the, and of course he, he created, uh, you know, in a, a cultural icon, a cinematic movie icon, uh, you know, in Indiana Jones. I mean, he's just as iconic as Rocky or Darth Vader, right? I mean, he, he is, that is sort of, the quintessential archetype of when I think of Harrison Ford, you can't help but think of him donning that fedora. You know what I mean? I mean, that really is, you know, I think it's, I, I think it's his, again, I think that's the best sort of everything that when, you know, when we think of Harrison Ford, because Harrison Ford is predominantly that guy. He's that kind of star, right? Most of the movies he's done have been, you know, action oriented kind of movies right so i wouldn't necessarily say he's an action star but i would definitely say that that is sort of you know that's sort of who he is per se so that's why it's number one because i think it it encompasses everything but i think his best performance in terms of an actor that he's ever done is the Mosquito Coast, which is number two. Now, some of you might be thinking, but what about Patriot Games? What about, yeah, but that's another action movie. He was great in that. He was great in that. But when we're trying to decipher, you know, we can only pick one, right? And so when we're trying to decipher his best movies, like, like what are five movies that you would show somebody to give them a well-rounded sort of look at who Harrison Ford is as an actor, I think these are the five that I would probably show, okay? Uh, first, right? I show them the fugitive, right? The vulnerable, you know, uh, guy who's shy, who's been wrongfully accused, who goes after, you know, what he, you know, trying to prove his innocence, great performance, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? I show what lies beneath because he's, it's a role reversal, right? Show that, gotta show that. I show regard Henry, my God, he's playing this guy who's this hotshot dick of a prick who all of a sudden does a 180 because he has brain damage, right? And we watch him struggling to regain his motor skills again and to move and to talk and to speak. Jesus Christ, got to show that. Fuck, you know, and it's so not what you think of when you think of Harrison Ford. You know what I'm saying? And that's why it's got to be on there. Number two, The Mosquito Coast, for all the reasons I said, my God, an incredible performance as an actor. You got to show that. Number one, Raiders of the Lost Ark. It encompasses almost everything. You know, it is, that is Harrison Ford. He is that guy. You know what I mean? I mean, that's what we think of, right? So now, if you want to go to honorable mentions, of course, I would throw Witness on there from 1985. The the one and only time he was nominated for his Academy Award. He did not win, but... Witness, again, very much like Regarding Henry or The Mosquito Coast, great performance, right? Great performance. So when I look at something like Witness, Regarding Henry, and The Mosquito Coast, I don't want to put all three on there because they're all similar in the sense that they're all great performances. So then I got to break it down further and go, okay, what would I, even though he was nominated for an Academy Award for uh, witness and rightly so it was a great performance great movie I look at the mosquito coast and I'm just like man that's it's tough it's really tough it's you you guys gotta see the mosquito coast it's like it's not even Harrison Ford it's like it's not even Harrison Ford it is it's it's awesome shit so that's why it you know won out but certainly you could put you know 
um, witness on here. Like if you were to say, no, I'm going to show somebody witness instead of the mosquito ghost. I'd be like, okay. I mean, you're not, you're not, okay. It's not, you know what I mean? Um, another honorable. And now some people might be thinking, well, why didn't you put Blade Runner on there? Well, because Blade Runner Great movie, right? Great movie with with symbolism and layers and, you know, the philosophical sort of meaning of the movie and great science fiction movie, okay? Now, when I was a kid and I watched that for the very first time, I was bored to tears because I didn't, I was a boy and I didn't understand you know, I wasn't, I wasn't old enough to understand really what was going on. And it's not like Blade Runner is a, is a high octane action sci-fi adventure. Okay. It's, it's, it's pretty, you know, there's a slow burn there. Right. And, you know, really what makes Blade Runner cool is more of the philosophical themes of the movie and the, and the what ifs and the, ah, oh, you know what I mean? Mixed in with a little bit of action here or there. Um, Blade Runner is a great science fiction movie, but I don't necessarily think it's a great Harrison Ford movie. Do you know what I mean? I'm not saying it's a bad Harrison Ford movie. That's not what I'm saying. Harrison Ford is serviceable in the movie. He's fine. He's Harrison Ford. But I don't necessarily think that's a great example of a Harrison Ford movie. Do you know what I mean? It's a great science fiction movie and it's a good Harrison Ford movie. But I think there are other better examples when we're breaking down Harrison Ford as the actor to point to. Uh, same thing goes with Patriot Games, Clear and Present Danger. Great action movies, right? But there's nothing, and same with Air Force One. Air Force One, my God, great action movie. But he's just as good in The Fugitive as he is in Air Force One. And Air Force One, Patriot Games, Clear and Present Danger, and The Fugitive are all similar in the sense that they're all action movies. Right. So you got to look at them and you got to kind of say what encompasses what 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 role really is he showing a bit more range and what role is is there a, is is he showing sort yeah what what is what is more of a you know, a bit more range, right? And I think that would go to The Fugitive, right? I think I think the stakes also lend it to that a bit more. But that's not saying that if you were to take, you know, The Fugitive off here and you put Air Force One on there, somehow that's wrong. Harrison War Air Force One is a fucking great movie. When I say great movie, I don't mean it's like, you know, the Godfather. I just mean that it's 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 great Harrison Ford fun. It's a great movie. It's great. It's great. But I think there are other examples when we're talking about Harrison Ford as the actor, right? Because then, you know, they start to bleed into each other a bit, right? They're all action movies. They're all, you know, you kind of have to pick one. So yeah, The Fugitive, What Lies Beneath regarding Henry the Mosquito Coast and Raiders. Honorable mentions Witness, Blade Runner, Empire Strikes Back. I throw that on there because it's like, well... Why not? I mean, you know, at this point, throw the Empire Strikes Back on there, right? You know, but I don't necessarily think, I think Her I think Indiana Jones, if you were to pick Indiana Jones or Han Solo, I think Indiana Jones is the better example of, of the, of the uh, you know, action sort of star uh, than Han Solo is. Because Han Solo is also a complimentary piece, part of an ensemble as well, right? Whereas Indiana Jones is the star. He's the guy, you know? Uh, but you know, I mean, listen, you want to throw air force one on there, knock yourself out. I love air force one, you know, um, presumed innocent. That's another great movie, right? Working girl. That was a good movie. I wouldn't throw, but see, that's an example. I wouldn't throw working girl on there. Great movie. He was good in it, but is it a great Harrison Ford movie? I don't really know. You know what I mean? I like Patriot games a bit better than clear and present danger. I like them both. Saw both in the theater back in the early nineties. Um, but again, you know, the, it it's, yeah, like I, I think I think these are sort of the best examples of Harrison Ford as an actor. And, um, but you wouldn't be wrong to include, you know, some of the others. Um, and, but again, and again, what, what I try to do, and I'm not always successful at it, but what I try to do is I try to be as objective as possible. Because listen, if I was to put my favorite Harrison Ford movies, well, I mean, a lot of these would be my favorite Harrison Ford movies, to be honest with you. But if, you know, what pop culture says should be your favorite Harrison Ford movies, well, that's easy. That would be probably The Last Crusade. That would be um, Air Force One. That would be, um, let's see, uh, Empire. That would be, uh, what else? Uh, that would be, hmm, going back, 80s, yeah. Uh, maybe maybe Temple of Doom, you know? No, no, Raiders for sure. I think that would be on there. Uh, but, but then now it's like, wait a minute, we got two Indiana Jones movies on there. Like, you, like you can't, you can't, it's, it's the same guy. He's the same guy in both movies. So you, you can't put those two on there. Like, I never had clear and present danger and 
you know, Patriot games. You know what I mean? So I'm just trying to be as objective as I possibly can. Uh, certainly if I, I mean, if I made this a top 10 list, I would put Air Force One on there. That's a, the only thing I don't like about Air Force One. And it was bad even then. It was bad even then. And that tells you, it, if it was bad in 1997, it ain't going to hold up, you know, is when the, when Air Force One, the plane crashes into the ocean. <sighs> Ooh, that's some bad CGI. It was bad 23 years ago because I saw the movie twice in the theater. And I remember thinking, oh, that just does not look good. There's no way I would have let that pass. I would have been like, guys, this looks like ass. Let's just let's just uh, show the plane on its way down and create some sort of kerfuffle with commotion and maybe uh, the explosion in the water or so let, let's let's do but let's not show that plane hitting and then tipping over into the water because it looks like ass it really does it really does it doesn't look very good it doesn't look very good it didn't look good in 1997 um that's the only thing i don't like about but i love the movie who doesn't like that right who's who doesn't like air force one great stuff uh and that's certainly and of course that is on here i, I do have it i have three I, I have four honorable mentions witness uh blade runner empire uh air force one and and um uh, sorry. There we go. Drop my my thing. Um, so it's uh, it's yeah. I mean, these are these are you know. So if you guys, how many people? American Graffiti. Yeah, American Graffiti. That was one of his first movies, nineteen seventy three. How many people have seen the Mosquito Coast? That's what I want to know. How many people have now? Be honest. It's okay if you haven't. It's one of those ones that you know. How many people have seen the Mosquito Coast? Because it's uh. It's, it's great. How many people have seen Frantic? Harrison Ford's Frantic. How many people have seen that? That's a good movie. You know, not as good as, as The Mosquito Coast, but that's good. Nick P was here, says, I have. Never seen it, Dave. I haven't seen it. You guys got to watch it. You guys got to watch it. Helen Mirren, Harrison Ford, River Phoenix. It's a drama, but it's really good. Like, by the end of the movie, you'll be like, whoa. Like, and you got to think of where Harrison Ford was at that time. I mean, this is 1986, right? He had done Witness. Harrison Ford was trying to branch away from what he had become, right? Because, of course, he did Star Wars in 77. Then he did a couple little small ones between Star Wars and Empire. But then he does Empire in 80, then Raiders in 81, Blade Runner in 82, Temple of Doom in 84. He was becoming that action guy, right? So that's why he, you know, he was like, okay, I, I want to branch out. So he does Witness in 85. He does the Mosquito Coast in 86. Frantic, which is another sort of... Uh, uh, cool. Frantic was 88, I think. Frantic Frantic was, okay, so he does Witness, The Mosquito Coast, Frantic, Working Girl. He does four movies that have, I mean, not that there aren't a couple little action scenes in The Mosquito Coast or um, Witness, but they're not action movies per se. They're, they're not what he we, we, we think of when we think of Harrison Ford. So he does four movies between 88, sorry, 85 and 89, there's no action Harrison Ford movies. And this is, you know, he's in his prime here, right? And then he does Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade in 89. But then he backs off again. And he does Presumed Innocent in 1990 regarding Henry in 1991. Those two movies are not action films. And then he comes back and does Jack Ryan in 92, The Fugitive, Clear and Present, Danger. And then he backs off again and does Sabrina. The Devil's Own in 97, uh, not a bad Harrison Ford movie either with him and Brad Pitt. But yeah, please uh, uh, go and, go and uh, watch The Mosquito Coast. Uh, if you are a big Harrison Ford fan and you want to see Harrison Ford in a role that almost doesn't feel like Harrison Ford, go watch The Mosquito Coast. You'll thank me. Um, yeah, Jason Wiley says, The Frisco Kid. Yep, that was... Uh, what That was... Uh, that was eight, 78, I think it was. Let me see here. 78, 79, 79. Yeah, 79 was the Frisco Kid. Yeah, and Apocalypse Now, he had a small role in that, of course. I thought he had a role in the conversation. I was wrong. I was wrong. It was Hanover Street I was thinking of. That's right. I was wrong. He wasn't in the conversation. I thought he was. Weird. Oh, no, he was. He was. He was. 1974. Yes, he was. I was correct. It was just back a bit. That's right. I was just going to say, I thought he had a small role in that. I thought he was in the conversation. Yep, he was. Gene Hackman. Um, so, yeah. So, hey, if you're watching after the fact, comment below and let me know your 
top Harrison Ford movies. Uh, try to be as objective as you possibly can. I know it's hard to, you know, uh, remove the emotional attachment of your favorites. And sometimes your favorite can be one of his best, right? Hundred percent. I mean, it's not that it's not an exact science. I just wanted to sort of create a list and get people to think outside the box a bit, and get people kind of going, "Oh yeah, Mosquito Coast." I never even, well, I never even thought of, "Oh, frantic." Why? Well, because there, it's it's very easy to go to what everybody's going to say. You know what I mean? It's just, and I wanted to kind of stir the pot a little bit and get people thinking about these movies that not a lot of people think of. I mean, there are some on there that you do, but there's a few that you probably don't. So anyway, let's go over to the chat room here. See what you guys are saying. Um, let me see. Uh, where's the chat? Here we are. A couple of super chats did come in. Chris Haim sends in a super chat. Thank you, Chris. Says, just popping in, uh, just popping on live to show support. Hype to support. It's me, Billy, as well. Thank you so much, Chris. Really appreciate it, man. We are hyped to have you support the film as well. Billy Van sends in a super chat. Says, do you have a Harrison Ford movie that you had high hopes for, but it didn't reach your expectations when you saw the film? That is really good. And then Intel Wild sends a super chat. Says, no honorable mention. Yeah, they're just excuses to extend lists. How can you not with Harrison Ford, though, right? I mean, just amazing. Um, a Harrison Ford movie I had high hopes for that didn't, that I was really disappointed with. That's a good question. You know, um, not really, I don't think. Um, I don't think so. I mean, maybe Six Days, Seven Nights. Uh, Six Days, Seven Nights is not a bad movie, you know, it's, a, but I think because he was coming off of Air Force One, Air Force One was 97, Six Days, Seven Nights was 98, and I saw Six Days, Seven Nights in the movie theater with my, uh, my brother Neil and my mom at the time, and I remember, I think Six Days, Seven Nights is a cute little romantic comedy adventure, but I think coming out on the heels of Air Force One, or not on the heels, sorry, after Air Force One. Coming after Air Force One, which was a high-octane summer blockbuster, you know, he's the president of the United States, get off my plane, you know, and the whole, and it's a, it's a great action movie. Like I said, it could easily be on here, folks. Easily, easily. It's a great action movie. It's a great Harrison, it, 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 it's a great example of a Harrison Ford action movie. I just think that The Fugitive might be a little better because of the vulnerability we see in the character. And that's why The Fugitive's there and maybe not Air Force One. And then you might say, well, you could put Air Force One and The Fugitive on there. But, you know, again, for, for the reasons why I said earlier, which is why I didn't. Um, but yeah, I love Air Force One. He doesn't fucking like Air Force One. Uh, I think when I left the theater after seeing Six Days, Seven Nights, I remember thinking to myself, eh, yeah, it was fun. It was fun. It was fine, but I guess, I don't know, coming off of Air Force One, you were expecting something bigger, and I don't know, it was, it's, it's fine, it's a cute little, it's a cute little romantic comedy adventure movie, but it's not Air Force One, you know what I mean, and I think maybe, maybe that would be one, but I can't really think of anything beyond that where I was like, whoa, fuck yeah, and then I was like, that was shit, fucking garbage, I can't really think of anything like that, uh, not to my knowledge anyway. Uh, okay. No more super chats missed. Good, good, good. Great to see everybody here. Uh, everybody's talking. Amstel 54 says, do you think Harrison is a grump or just get asks a lot of dumb questions? I don't think he's a grump. I think this is, here's the thing with Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford has always been very dry. He's always had a very dry sense of humor. He's always been very, he's always been like that. Go back and watch interviews with him from the you know the 80s or the late 70s when he was you know promoting star wars i mean he, he's always been like that uh he's always had a very shy vulnerability there's a vulnerable sort of uh thing about his personality he, he's shy he's not a very extroverted person not a very charismatic person i've always said that he's a terrible interview i mean it depends. Sometimes he comes through and you watch a Harrison Ford interview and he settles into a groove. I don't know if he's had a glass of wine, you know, before the show or something where he's actually not bad. He's actually seems a little bit of, you know, seems he's got a little bit of personality to him, but he's not a great interview. He, he's, he's very dry, very monotone. You know, he's, he's, he's not great. Um, I think it's just his personality. I, I think he's, 
we mistakenly sometimes think that when we see these actors doing their bit, that they are that person, and they're not. They're playing a role, they're, they're acting. That doesn't mean that there aren't people who aren't like that. I mean, look at Robin Williams, right? Um, but I think, I don't think he's a grump. I think that with age, what's happened now is like a lot of men who get older, not every man does, but like a lot of men who do, uh, they start to sound like old men. You know, I mean, there. look, there are 70-year-old men who sound like this. And then there are 70-year-old men who sound like you and I. Hey, hey, what's going on, man? What's happening? You know what I mean? I mean, it's all, I mean, I don't know what happens with the muscles and the voice box or the, you know, the vocal cords or the, you know, something happens, right? Where you get older and you start sounding older, but it's not like old men who, who talk like this sounded like this when they were 30. <laughs> you know what I mean? They didn't, hey, what's going on? I'm 35. I mean, that, that's not, you know, they didn't sound like that when they were 30. So I think, Harrison Ford appears to be a grump because now he kind of sounds like an old man a little bit, right? He sounds like an old man. And when you when you when you incorporate that old man, you know, he's, you know, he's nearly 80, uh, with his what he's always had, which is his dry, sort of very mono, he sounds even more like an old man now and even more like a grump. But when you go watch Harrison Ford interviews from the 80s, he sounds like this. Well, I uh, I think maybe it's uh, more like that. I'm big fan of, uh, you know, of what they've done. And uh, he's always been like that. He's always been like that. I mean, every now and then he might show a little bit of personality, but he's always essentially been that guy. Well, you incorporate old man voice. Well, I think that uh, was, now he sounds really old and kind of, I, I, I don't think that's the case. I, I think it's just the product of who he was, who he is, and the fact that he's nearly 80 now. And there are some people who, you know, make it to 75 and sound like, they're young still, but I think that's generally kind of what's going on there. But that doesn't mean that in his in his in his older age, he doesn't he's not fed up with certain things. He might be. Uh, Edwin A. Sordo says on the subject of actors and there and uh, are there actors that, in your opinion, are overrated, Mister Dave? Great question. Overrated. Well, um, I think there are overrated. Um, of course, yes. There are definitely actors that are overrated, uh, 100%. Who those actors are specifically, I, I, I don't know. I, I think, you know, I, I think there are, there are actors who are popular, who uh, become very rich, very wealthy, very successful. Of course, success is subjective, um, but very successful financially based on their popularity, based on their pop culture footprint, uh, you know, I mean, look at Paris Hilton years ago. Not so much now. She's sort of fallen off the map, thank Christ. Um, but, you know, I mean, she wasn't popular because she was, you know, talented, right? There, there are those that get popular very fast, very quick, because they, they are, they're marketable. You know, you, you can market them. I mean, I think Britney Spears is the byproduct of that. Now, I'm not saying that Britney Spears doesn't possess talent. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying she's talentless, but she certainly is not a, you know, Christina Aguilera when it comes to singing. She's certainly not Celine Dion. She's certainly not Adele when it comes to the talent of singing. But she was very marketable. She was very attractive, right? She had a little style of her own, poppy, you know, and it was right time, right place. She was marketable like you wouldn't believe. Her songs were funky and, attra and, and attractive. Her songs were funky and, and uh, um, um, you know, uh, they were had good beats and, you know, they were catchy and, and the, it was right time, right place. She was very marketable, you know, and she, and you know, with a little bit of auto tune, you can, you know, well, my, you know, but whatever you, you know, throw in a little bit of auto tune and she sounds great, you know? And, uh, so very, so there, there's, there's two sides, there, there's many different ways of people that, that get popular and overrated and things like that. So yeah. Do I think there are actors that are, are overrated? Yes. Who, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know. It depends on what you classify as overrated, right? I mean, you could say, you know, what's what's the bar, right? Like, what's the benchmark, you know? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I'm sure the chat room will be able to throw out names like it's going out of style. But certainly, uh, 
Yeah, and and like actors, there there are people that are marketable, you know, that very marketable, you know, because of their looks or because of their following or you know whatever the case is. Um, I think I'm just trying to think of who's popular right now, who, who might be overrated. Um, I I got to think on that. Like I take these things seriously, so I got to think. Great question. Definitely, I'm sure I could come up with a couple, but I got to think on that. Um, Jonathan Ball says, new cast of Star Wars movies. Uh, I disagree. I disagree. I think John Boyega and Daisy Ridley and Oscar Isaac are brilliant actors. Um, well, I mean, certainly Oscar Isaac is. He's got more of a portfolio and a filmography. Uh, John Boyega, I think, is extremely talented. And I also think Daisy Ridley is talented as well. So, no, I disagree with that. I think they did a fine job in, in the movies and with the material they were given. You know, any issues I had with any of the movies were not because of any acting, that's for sure. Um, H.G. Pennypacker says, Stanley Kubrick was super overrated as a director for me. Ooh, them fighting words. Uh, I disagree, 100%. I disagree. Um, I think Stanley Kubrick is, uh, if I think, uh, I, I think he's a genius. And, and, and I think that, and I'm not suggesting that this is why you don't like him or think he's overrated shouldn't say not like him because you didn't say that you just thought you know you just said he was overrated i think um stanley kubrick's films are largely uh cerebral in nature in nature there's a there's a not 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 every one but there is a there is a he's an acquired taste there's a there's a certain style that he has and it's not a style that is that is pop culture. It's not a style that the masses are going to enjoy. It's not a style that that everybody is going to like. Um, you know, Steven Spielberg, uh, I think, is probably arguably the greatest filmmaker of all time. And, and there's reasons for that. I plan on doing uh, a video on that too, a show on that. Um, but he is much more of a pop culture. He His movies will please more of the masses than Kubrick's films were, uh, will. Kubrick's films are, are, are more, uh, yeah, there's, there's, they're, they're, he tackles larger themes and, and stories and films that are, that just not everybody's going to enjoy or like. Um, but I think when you understand the man and understand the, the, uh, a lot of the films that he's done, uh, he, he's a, he's, it's too bad he didn't make more films because um, he didn't make a lot of movies and he would take many years off in between. Um, so I, I think, uh, I, I disagree. I disagree. But you're entitled to feel that way, of course. Uh, Duke Fleet says, Stanley Kubrick is number one to me. Number one to you. Number one. Uh, Intel Wild sends in a super chat and says, Hey, Dave, I was watching Wham! yesterday, and they were saying this weekend, I believe, JLC, Green, and others are watching H18 and gonna narrate through it. Also talked about a possible trailer leak after it. Heard anything? Uh, well, I've, I, I've heard about this. I, unless there's something I'm missing, I don't get the impression that they're going to be that the watch party that you that you're going to be seeing them like how I do two dudes and some bullshit. I don't get the impression it's going to be that. I think what it's going to like I don't think they're going to be live on camera uh, while everybody's watching the movie. I don't think and he's answering live questions like this while you guys are all watching because it's via Twitter. And um my under and I stand to be corrected my understanding is that that they will be available right you use the ha you you use a certain hashtag to ask your questions and they will see it come up via the hashtag in their feed and they will respond to you typing right the, so it's not it's not a verbal exchange like this it's all through tweets and but everybody who's hashtagging at that time is presumably watching the movie in real time. And I would assume they are as well. Who knows? Um, that's my guess. And then after that's done there, I don't know if they jump on. Maybe they do do a live. I don't I, I'm not getting the impression that you're going to be seeing them. That's not the impression. I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's something I'm missing here. Somebody who knows more about it. And don't chime in with your... Th I mean, if you absolutely know 100%, you can post in the uh, in the um, uh, chat room 
whether or not that is true. I, I, that's the impression I get. I don't think it's like it. It's not like a two dudes where they're like, Hey guys, David Gordon green here. Okay. Let's watch this together. Oh, there's the opening. I remember when we shot this pumpkin thing and you guys are all chatting with him. That's not what's happening. Um, not from my understanding anyway, it's just all done through, through tweets. Um, and they will be responding to as many tweets as they can from what I understand. Um, but I will say that, so do I think a trailer is going to drop this weekend? No, I don't. Um, I think if, if anything would, they would surprise, you know, people with something, uh, maybe a poster, maybe a poster that wouldn't surprise me a trailer. I don't think you're going to get this weekend. I think the watch party was done because you're not getting a trailer this weekend, not because you are going to get a trailer this weekend. I think it was a good thing to do. It's good PR to do to, to, you know, while everybody's in quarantine to have people, you know, to keep it out there, right? Out of sight, out of mind. And, and you want to, and no doubt that, and they know this, they know that the first 4,721 tweets are going to be about where the fuck is the trailer. They know that they're prepared for it. I, if the, tra if they do suddenly drop the trailer this weekend, I admit that will surprise me, will surprise me. I don't think they're going to do that. Um, if they do surprise fans with anything, you might, you'd get maybe the poster, maybe the poster, maybe, you know, um, but I think that's it. I think this is just, you know, what it is just a watch party of the original film. And once it's done, people are like, Hey, it was great. All right. See ya. Cheers. And that's it. That's what I think it is. Um, but yeah, please somebody in the chat room, uh, let me know because I don't think this is a, like a two dudes thing where you're like David Gordon Green and Jamie Lee Curtis are hanging out, watching the movie and you're chatting with them in real time, like typing. And they're answering like how I do with Tony on two dudes. I don't think that's what's happening. I think it's all done through, you want to ask a question to David Gordon Green, you ask it, you hashtag it to the right hashtag, and then he will presumably see it and at, and at you back. That's what I think is going on. But I stand to be corrected. Gary Rangel, oh, did, did I answer everything uh, in your super chat until a while? Let me see here. Uh, yes, I think I did. Gary Ringel says, Dave, after Halloween 1978, John Carpenter was reluctant to do a sequel, but he eventually did. But Tommy Lee Wallace was the only one reluctant to participate in anything with Michael Myers. Why is that? Well, uh, I'm not Tommy Lee Wallace and I don't want to speak for him, but I will say this. I will say that um, it is probably for the same reasons <laughs> that John Carpenter did. I would imagine Tommy Lee Wallace was probably like, well, unless he was doing something else at that time, that's entirely possible. But if it's not that, I would imagine that, because Tommy Lee Wallace is a smart, a smart chap, he was probably like, why the fuck are we doing this sequel? It was done. He knew the original intent of the character. He was working side by side with John Carpenter. He knew the story. He knew what was going on. He even donned the outfit a couple of times. I mean, he was probably like, why are we, why are we doing this again? The, the, the story's been told. This is not a movie where we were supposed to... So I would imagine it was probably something similar to that. Unless he was all gung-ho for it, but he was attached to something else. I don't know. He was doing something else at the time. Um... I mean, he, he did come back and direct Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, but that doesn't have anything to do with Michael Myers. So, I don't know. I don't know. That would be my guess, anyway. Uh, let me see here. Toronto Freddy says, Afternoon, Dave and Chad. Good afternoon, Toronto Freddy. Just want to make sure I didn't miss any super chats. No, that was the last one that came in was, was uh, Intel Wild. Good, good, good. Mark Williams says, Have you ever seen the Harrison Ford interview on Jimmy Kimmel Live when he was dressed up like a in a dog costume? Yes, I have. Hilarious. I actually had the, uh, 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 the last time I was in Los Angeles back uh, last fall, that was a busy week, man. I was there for a week. Uh, I was there for the Voice Arts Awards, obviously over at Warner Brothers. And because uh, I was nominated, my fourth nomination. Didn't win, didn't win. But, uh, you know, four-time nominees, not not too, uh, not too shabby. Um, so there was a lot going on in regards to the award show and everything going on over at Warner Brothers. But when, but also that week, uh, my... Um, 
girlfriend and I, we, we went to see a, a, a taping of Jeopardy, which was really cool. We went to see a taping of Jimmy Kimmel Live. That was really interesting. We had dinner with Mickey Yablons and his, and his wife and his son, which was just an absolute blast. Had so much fun getting to know them more. And they're just super, super people. My God, they are lovely people. I mean, I'm not just saying that. I'm not, I, they are lovely people. Um, and then, of course, I had the face cast done for Dylan's new nightmare. I was over at Nora's place with Cecil and Vince and everybody getting that all done. It was a busy fucking week. And we also had time to drive up the coast to Morro Bay, which is, I mean, it was crazy. It was a very busy week. But uh, yeah, I actually had a, a chance to see a taping of Jimmy Kimmel and it was really annoying because they, they, they handed out Free, not, it's not a big deal. I'm just talking about the principle of it, right? It sucks when you live in another country sometimes. They handed out uh, these cards, free year subscription to Disney Plus. Now, it's, o- it's only like eight bucks, right? It's not a big deal. But I was like, well, that's kind of cool. It's kind of nice. Yeah, whatever, right? But of course, I live in Canada and it, it, and it didn't work. And I was like, lame. <laughs> so anyway, I, I had to pay the eight bucks. Um, let me see here. Uh, Die Hard Drummer 84 says, Charlie Sheen had some interesting movies. I think you'd like Dave. Would you do top five on him? Um, Top five on Charlie? Probably not. I'll be honest with you. I'm not a huge Charlie Sheen fan. It's not, I don't not like Charlie Sheen, but he's not... I don't care about him enough to do a top five Charlie Sheen films. Just don't care. Don't care. But yeah, he's done. He's done. You know, some interesting movies for sure. He, he's he's an interesting fellow. Let's just say, uh, Troy Stasha, Stasha, Stasha. Uh, but it got scrapped because Ridley Scott is still working on the prequels to Alien. Oh, you said here we go. Oh, I also really enjoy Neil Blomkamp's movies. He was supposed to direct a reboot of the Alien franchise that would have been a direct sequel to Aliens, uh, wiping out the other sequels from uh, yeah from canon. A la, you're absolutely right. I remember that. I do remember that. Yep. Uh, Toronto Freddy says, whenever I need a good laugh, I watch your hate mail videos. The first one in particular, frigging hilarious. When can we expect the next one? Well, you know, it's funny, uh, Toronto Freddy. Um, I, I, you know, ever since I started doing those hate mail and I don't, I think I've only done three of them over the last like two years. I, I haven't done a lot. Uh, but ever since I started doing that, I don't receive nearly as much. Like every now and then I'll receive something. Right. Where it's some, you know, somebody, but I don't receive nearly as much as I used to. And I'm a little disappointed by that because every single piece of hate mail you saw in those three videos and what I did like five each video or someone so would have been like 15, all real, all genuine shit I received. You know, it was taken from um, the Facebook messages and it was taken from uh emails because sometimes people would go to my website even though they're not supposed to email me through my site unless it's you know voiceover you know uh related or industry related it says so on my site but sometimes people you know they don't want to message me through facebook or maybe they don't have facebook so they'll go to my site and they'll just be like Arr! and sometimes it'll come through there too and i'm just like this is hilarious like i'm going to respond to it um yeah some of them are funny man some of them are the, the ones that I find the funniest are the ones that just make no sense. Like they're saying things and you, you, you can hear and see the passion. You can feel the passion in their typing. But what they're saying makes literally no sense. Like they're using words that are not even words. You know, <laughs> some of them I'm sure are typos, but funny shit, man. Yeah, so as soon as I get like enough, I'll be more than happy to do another one, but I don't I don't really get them anymore, which is I'm, I'm a little disappointed by it, to be honest with you. Vegas Courier says, maybe they're waiting to see what happens with the virus before releasing anything with October 16th date. Maybe they could do something that still says H kills is coming soon. Oh, well, that, that's exactly what they're doing. Oh, 100%. I mean, you know, we've talked about this here on the, uh, on the, uh, on the channel that, you know, now theaters are more than likely going to start hopefully opening in July. Listen, I, I, I still think there is, you will get to see Halloween kills in the theater, but because this is a day by day, week by week situation, they, they don't, they're playing the short game, not the long, or they're playing the long game, but they're, but they're making decisions uh, via the short game, which is just every day something can change. So, you know, 
it's possible that Halloween Kills could get pushed or pushed to VOD. Who knows? I don't know. But I'm just saying that, yes, that is why they haven't released anything yet. But even if Kills, here's the thing, guys. Even if there was no COVID-19, I still don't necessarily think we would have a trailer yet. Now, I understand that, that you know, st studios just because the trailer in June the previous year doesn't mean, or, you know, the previous two years ago, it doesn't mean that you would do the exact same thing again. No, it's not, it's not rocket science, but I think there, 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 there was a pattern that I think this year, there was a certain pattern that they could have followed. And, you know, if there was no COVID-19, that means you would still get TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival, at the beginning of September, which is where they held the world premiere of Halloween 18 two years ago. You had a, a universal distributed movie being released at the beginning of June in Candyman, no longer, of course. Now it's being released in September. I still think there was a high probability that the same, relatively the same pattern of marketing may have taken place. And if COVID-19 didn't exist, I think there was probably a high probability that you would have seen your first Kills trailer at the beginning of June. And when you went to see Candyman in theaters, you would have seen the Kills trailer playing in front of Candyman because they're both universal distributed pictures. That, that, I think that's a good educated guess. Doesn't mean it was going to happen, but I think that's that's a that's a high probability. Now it's not going to happen. Candyman's not opening at the beginning of June, and we don't even know what's going to happen in October. So I that's why I still don't think you're going to see that trailer this weekend. I don't think you will. Something maybe, maybe they've and maybe not even a poster. Maybe they've just made something for the fans. Maybe it's another 30 second behind the scenes featurette. Maybe they've just done that again. That's possible entirely possible they could have just quickly put something together 30 seconds for the fans again it's not it's not the trailer and it's not even the poster but it's just an, it's just another little something to, to to keep it out there that's possible too but it would not surprise me in the slightest in the slightest if this weekend comes and goes and all it was was a halloween 2018 watch party nothing more wouldn't surprise me. Wouldn't surprise me. Um, Duke Fleet says, Dave, if you could meet Harrison Ford, what would you ask him? Oh, I don't know. You know, I, I've, I've always, I'd love to meet him. You know, years ago, I, I, I wanted to work with him. Like I was, I was, you know, becoming an on-camera actor and I was getting into commercials and all that kind of stuff and doing docudramas and, and uh, I would love to have worked with him. I, I never wanted to meet him as a fan. I wanted to meet him as a colleague. And I think that would have been really cool. Um, cause I didn't, you know, I never wanted to be that guy. Um, but of course, you know, now he's 78 years old and of course where my career is gone and where, you know, that's probably not going to happen. Uh, you know, you never say never, who knows, but, um, but I would say that if I had to ask him something, I would probably ask him something unrelated to his career because I know about his career. I've read all about his career. I don't need to ask him, what's your favorite movie? I know what his favorite movie is, you know? How did you feel about, I already know how he feels about that. There's 5,000 interviews. I would ask him something like, I don't know, what's your favorite sandwich? You know, uh, what's your favorite movie? Not of yours, but your favorite movie. That probably is out there somewhere. He's probably mentioned that somewhere. But that, you know, if you want to keep it movie related, ask him that, you know. Or, you know, what do you, um, what do you really enjoy doing in your spare time? you know, or, um, is there like, like th things like that, you know, what's your favorite thing to do at, um, Christmas time, you know, uh, tell me a funny Christmas story, uh, about you and your family, you know, cause he's got two older kids too. You know, he's got, uh, I think Ben, he's got a son, Ben, I think, I think is it Ben, not Ben solo. I'm talking about a, his, his real son, Ben, because he's got, he's got, he's got a young son who's like maybe 20, but he's got two older kids that are like in their fifties <clears throat> from a, a, a relate and, and not, they're not, uh, they're not Melissa Matheson's kids. Cause he was married to Melissa Matheson, the writer of ET there for a while, not her before her. Anyway, like, tell me a funny story about you as a dad, you know, tell me a funny story about you as a dad growing up, you know, and like, 
Christmas time or something. Like something like that. I, I, I think that would be cool because it's not, you know, he gets, I mean, you, I already, I, I don't need to ask him. So uh, how did you feel when you, when you put on the glove, the, 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 the bell and the gun for the first time? And we know how he felt. 5,000 people have asked him that. Ask him something different. Ask him something nobody would expect. And, you know, I take that, I take that, uh, I can't, I take that from my father. I remember a story about my father. Uh, and this is not, this is actually, this is not back when he was, uh, uh, like back in the, uh, the sixties or the seventies or even the eighties. This is, I think the early two thousands. So my dad was already a seasoned journalist at this time, but I remember he was in the Ottawa senators dressing room. The Ottawa senators are the hockey team here in Ottawa, Canada, the NHL team here in, here in, uh, Ottawa, which is our nation's capital here in Canada, for those of you that don't know. And this is going back to the early 2000s, I think. And there was a goalie on the Buffalo, uh, on the Buffalo Sabres, on the Ottawa Senators. He used to be on the Buffalo Sabres. That's why I said that name, Tom Barrasso. And uh, he was one of my, he, he was the reason why I liked the Buffalo Sabres back in the early 80s. But anyway, he was at the end of his career. This is the early 2000s. He was sort of, you know, playing his last few games with the Ottawa Senators. And uh, my dad was in, the dressing room and Tom Barrasso was known to have a, you know, a chip, a, a chip on his shoulder. But I mean, he, 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 he was getting asked the same questions by everybody. And at the time, do you guys remember, I forget his name. There was like that Cuban boy that came to Miami or so this is like 2099, 2000. There was something like a little Cuban boy that came to Miami. He was like, what was that? He was kidnapped or something, but he wanted to go back to Cuba. Or the, there was something, I forget what the boy's name was. Do you guys remember that? I mean, if you're old enough to remember, this is going back like 20 something years now because I was in college. Um, I forget now. Some There was some big thing going on with this boy that was from Cuba. He was in Miami, I don't, but he wasn't supposed to be in Miami or something. Do you remember that? Yeah, the, the, the disco dev remembers that. Um, he, uh, he was a refugee. Okay, cool. I was in college. Yeah, I was in college too. So you remember that, right? Okay, cool. Okay, some of you may not, but anyway, at least I'm not going. Elian Gonzalez, that's right. That's his name. That's right. Thank you so much. Is, we're, we're dating ourselves here, right? Yes, going back. Right. Anyway, so that was a big hot thing, right, at that time. And I remember my dad uh, said, uh, so you know, like, I mean, everybody's asking Tom Barrasso questions about hockey. Why'd you lose the game? How do you feel? What do you think you should have done? How do you feel about that? And he, of course, he's being like one wordy and being his typical arrogant self and just answering shit. And my dad piped up in the back and said something to the effect of, how do you feel about the Elian Gonzalez thing? It's kind of crazy, isn't it? And Barrasso was like, who said that? And it's like, it's like, oh, Earl McRae, you know? And then, and then all of a sudden it's like, it's like the sea parted. And Barrasso walked over to my dad and said, that's a great question, man. Uh, it's crazy to think, and gave my dad like 15 minutes of his time, you know, and he had this whole thing about, about that. And then of course, when you get them, when you lock them in, when you get them and you bring the, you know, and you make them realize that, you know, you're not that kind of guy, then you you will you let the conversation flow organically and if there's a moment where you feel you might be able to ask something a little more sports related or a little more movie you know related like maybe you like maybe you do want to say something like how did it feel to be on the millennium falcon again well it then feels earned right because you've 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 gone in there and you've and you've you know, you've you've asked them things about shit that they're thinking about too, that they care about away from the game, you know, away from the sport, right? And then when you want to ask, hey, you know, so, you know, before I let you go, you know, you, you, know, you think you guys got this? It's kind of crazy, isn't it? He's more likely to go, yeah, I know what you mean. I, I, you know, I think so. I think so. And it feels, and then it feels more organic that way. It was a brilliant move. My dad used to do that all the time. And it was part of what made him so good at his job. And uh, so, I, I think that's what I would do. You know, it's just kind of, to, and, and, and it's not that I, I don't want to know. I genuinely would love to. Who wouldn't, well, who wouldn't love to hear a, well, I guess you kind of have to be a Harrison Ford fan, but who wouldn't love to hear a Harrison Ford story about, 
you know, if you are a big fan, right, like I am, about him as a 28-year-old dad raising his kids and something funny happening at Christmas time. Like, that'd be such a funny story, you know? And it's, it's great stuff. It's great stuff. And it's stuff that nobody else is getting. And it's good shit. Anyway. The disco dev says, sounds like he was good to Dave's dad. Uh, sound, sounds like he was good to Dave's dad, though. Sounds like he was good to Dave's dad. Who was good to, you mean Tom Barrasso? Oh yeah, yeah, well he was. I mean, he was still, he was still a dick. Tom Barrasso was a dick, but he, he was, it, it was a smart calculated strategy that my dad would do. I mean, again, you, you can't really do this anymore <laughs> because of the time we, live in. But the reason why my dad was able to meet the Beatles is because my dad was, you know, it was 1966. So it was a very different era and time. And if you put on a hard hat and had a, you know, clipboard, you could make your way into any, if you looked like you belonged somewhere and you looked important, you could make your way in anywhere in 1966. My dad didn't do that. He was able to sneak up into certain areas and go up, you know, he was working for, he was working for the Toronto star at the time. My dad was able to make his way up to the Beatles hotel room, knock on the door. I think it was Lennon who opened the door and was like, you know, what are you doing here? Who are you? And my dad made up this thing about who he was and they were talking for a minute and things like that. And, but one of the bodyguards there was skeptical of my dad as he was writing some things down. It was a little skeptical. So it was like, no, no, you know, shut the, something like that, shut the door. And then the photograph that you see of my dad with the Beatles is later when the Beatles are coming out a side entrance that nobody is supposed to be. And there's my father pointing his pen at, you know, um, Lennon saying something to the effect of, ah, you know, it was me. I got you or something. And, you know, John Lennon's like, hey, it's you. Like they're kind of pointing at each other. It's kind of like, what? You know, and somebody snapped that great photograph. You know, it's kind of like the jig was up. Like, oh, you're, oh, you're, you're a reporter. You sneaky bass. It was something like that, right? My dad was, of course, you can't do that now. You can't do that now in this day and age. It was, it was 1966. It was easier to do then. You can't do that shit now. Are you kidding me? Jeez, you'd be handcuffed, thrown on the ground beaten to beating the shit out of I mean, you it'd be like that if surveillance security cameras all over the place fuck they put they're tapping your phones and shit you can't do that shit anymore ah what an era to grow up in though that would have been amazing of course i wasn't alive in 1966 but uh very cool uh let's see let me just move over uh toronto freddy send in a super chat i think i got that though right uh i think that was the last one Yes, yes, I did. It was the hate mail one. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, uh, this is good. This is good. This has been a good show. This has been a good show. Good show, good show. Um, let me see. Uh, Jason Wiley says, uh, we never got a Clint Eastwood and Harrison Ford film that would have been great and very similar actors. Um, I can see the similarities of what you're talking about. Yeah, I can. I mean, Harrison Ford has always been a more uh, physical actor. As like he likes to call it, he doesn't do stunts. He does physical acting. There is a difference, right? So for example, I mean, if Harrison Ford was to get into a tussle, you know, I mean, maybe not now because he's almost 80, but certainly in his prime, he could get into a tussle, right? So he could like, you know, grab the other actor and get thrown up against the wall and get into kind of a, a tussle, right? Physical acting, you know what I mean? Uh, he used to do all of that stunts is a different story, you know, like leaping off a building or, you know, being thrown through a window or, you know, um, those are stunts and that he, he, he doesn't do that. He leaves that for the trained professionals or being dragged behind a, a truck in Raiders of the Lost Ark, which for the close-ups they, they, they did, I believe they did drag him for a little bit, like very much just to get a few of the close-ups of his face, but the vast majority of the guy being dragged that's not Harrison Ford. That's his stunt. Or going under the fucking truck and things like that. But they they mixed and matched it, right? With things they did shoot, you know, and things they didn't. So it, it blends in seamlessly and you totally buy that that's Harrison Ford, 100%. Um, but yeah, but so so I would say that Clint Eastwood in the movies I've seen, he he's... He's more of a, he, 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 it's not that he hasn't done or doesn't do physical acting, but I think Harrison Ford is more physical than Clint Eastwood is. From what I remember anyway, but I haven't watched a couple of old, the older East, Eastwood films in a while. Uh, Mark Johnson says, uh, Toronto two cinema tickets for Halloween Kills just for you, dude. Toronto two cinema tickets for Halloween Kills just for you, dude. Who are you talking to, Mark? Are you talking to 
Toronto two Toronto two. It's capitalized. Is there is there somebody in here named Toronto? Are you talking to Toronto Freddy? Mother Mayhem is here. Awesome surprise after the comment I left yesterday. Love Harrison. Yes. Yeah, I'm a big Harrison Ford fan. My, he's, like I said, my favorite actor. You'll have to go back and watch the beginning of the show uh, to uh, get my my top five and and how I break it down and why I made the decision to to do the or why I made the decision to tackle it in the ways that I did. Because as you know, Mother Mayhem, I mean, this could easily be a top twenty. I mean, you know, I mean, it's really easy to kind of go, "Well, I like that, and I like this, and I like that, I like that too." I mean, it's just so easy to do that right so i had to i I like to challenge you know myself and kind of pick five movies and there's there's reasons for it so if you if you are just tuning in now you'll have to go back and watch the beginning and kind of see how i break it all down but it's uh yeah it's harrison Ford. my i mean i he's the best he's i i don't think he's the best actor in the world but he's certainly my favorite actor and i oh it's gonna be heartbreaking when he goes oh my god my god i i can't even my parents passed away in 2011 and I think Harrison Ford, I think th- th- that that will be the next hard. I, I, I really do. I think I'll have to take like a whole week off after that happens or something like that. I will definitely be doing when it, when it happens and hopefully it doesn't happen for, you know, at least another 10 years. Um, and who knows where we'll all be by then. But uh, certainly uh, I plan on honoring the man in some sort of way. Uh, I don't think I can narrow it down just fine. Well, see, that's the thing. That's what I'm talking about. And really, well, go back, watch the beginning of the show and you'll kind of see how I've, why I chose these films. But you're absolutely right. I mean, there's many that you could interchange with my list and it's not like, you know, I mean, they could, there's a lot of interchanging that could go on there. Uh, But I I like to challenge myself and maybe see if I could do it. But damn, there's so many good errors in forward movies. Tab of the Short says, anytime I cut a sweet potato... (laughs) I love the beginning of this. Anytime I cut a sweet potato, it makes me want cubed cheese. Anybody else feel the same way? What an interesting, random, very family guy thing to say. That is that's so good, Tabitha. You okay? <laughs> Darren Sand says, you okay, Tabitha? Um, yes, anytime I cut a sweet potato, it makes, makes me think of cubed cheese. Um, I cannot say that every time I have cut a potato, which, uh, admittedly is not very often, um, that I think of cubed cheese, but I got to say, I love me some cubed cheese. I mean, who doesn't like cubed cheese? You guys know what you should try? Go get, okay. You know, uh, this is going to sound like a really boring rice cakes, right? I know what you're thinking. Dave, it's fucking styrofoam, man. No, no. He- hear me out. Hear me out. Go get some rice cakes. You, you can even get maybe the flavored ones. Not Don't get like a chocolate chip one or something like that. But get you either a plain one or maybe, a, um, you know, yeah, maybe the popcorn flavored one. Maybe, but, but, but try plain. Don't get too crazy at first. Go get plain rice cake, okay? Take two rice cakes. Cut up some cheese, okay? Some cheddar cheese. Not mozzarella, some cheddar cheese. Lay three strips okay, on each one, pop them on a plate, or put them on a plate, I should say, pop them in the microwave for about 30, 35 seconds, let the cheese melt into the rice cake, take them out, dab a little bit of salt, it's good, it's good, and it's a healthy snack, it's healthy, you got the rice cakes, you got cheese, right, just a little bit of salt, it's really good, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the quarantine's making me the king of concoctions. That's all I'm going to say. Let me see. Uh, Da, 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 da. Vegas Courier says, rest in peace, Jerry Stiller, also known as Roy, uh, also to Roy Horn due to the virus. Yes, 100%. I could not agree more. Jerry Stiller, man. I mean, you know, a lot of people, I saw, and rightly so. I mean, he, but he, he, he and his wife had a huge career huge career long before Seinfeld. I mean, the first time I saw his wife was in the sitcom Elf. Now, of course, I'm not, you know, 70 years old. I know she had been doing many things prior to Elf, but she played Kate's mother, Kate Tanner, the mom in Elf. She played her mom. And that's where I first saw her as uh, Dorothy, 
That was it. Dorothy, I think, was her name in Elf. And, of course, where I saw Jerry Stiller for the first time was, like most people my age and, you know, a bit older, uh, would be in Seinfeld as George Costanza's father. But he wasn't the first dad. He wasn't the first dad. He was the second dad. Um, but where I loved him the most was as Arthur Spooner on The King of Queens. I mean, that, I mean, that was just, I can't even, I mean, Jesus, you know, he was hilarious, you know? So, uh, um, he outlived his wife and they've been together for like 60 something years. Um, and of course the father of Ben Stiller, the, the mother and father of Ben Stiller. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, crazy. Uh, Tablet Short says, Ben Stiller didn't say how he died. Was it the virus? No, just natural causes, old age. I mean, he was, what, was he 85, 82, 80, 86, something like that? I think he was in his mid, mid-80s, mid something like that. Uh, I think so. Anyway, let's go back, make sure I didn't miss a super chat. I did not. Good, good, good. Just always like to check in. Okay, we'll go for a few more minutes here. We'll go for a few more minutes. Ba -na -na -na. Dun, 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 dun. Robert Andrew Paul says, King of Queens is a classic. I love King of Queens, man. Love me some, some King of Queens. Uh, I definitely identify with Kevin James in a sense of humor. Kevin James and I, if, if, if Kevin James and I had met years ago, we would have become like besties. Like I, his, his sense of humor is exactly like my, well, I mean, obviously there's some differences, but I totally identify with the writing and his character of Doug, like the, 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 the just the way he, he portrays Doug Heffernan. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan, like a big fan of the, the character and the writing, just Kevin J and now, you know, what he's doing on his YouTube channel and how he's got that sound guy skits. If you haven't checked out Kevin James YouTube channel right now, do yourself a favor after the show's done, go to YouTube, type in Kevin James, go to his YouTube channel, start following him on Instagram. The guy is fucking hilarious. He's got like a series of um, uh, videos where he, he, not he himself, obviously it would be his team around him. Basically, you know, almost superimpose him. They, they put him in scenes of movies as the boom operator, as the sound guy. And the series is called like the sound guy. Watch the Joker one. It's fucking hilarious. And the way they match the lighting. I mean, it looks like if you had never seen Joker, or if you had never seen A Star is Born, that's another one he's done. Or if you had never seen, I think he did uh, I Am Legend too with Will Smith. I think he, he's done a bunch. If you had never seen these movies and you were just watching these clips, you would literally think that Kevin James was in that scene. That is how good they match the lighting. Like it literally looks like he's in the movie, especially the Joker one. Oh my God. It is so funny. You've got to see it. You've got to watch it. You'll thank me for it. Uh, Chris Haim sends in a super chat. Thank you, Chris says, did you see the out of touch video on Kevin James channel gold or is that the one where they're jogging and they're not supposed to touch each other or shake hands? Is that, is that one? Is that the one you're talking about? Cause that is funny. That is funny. Darren Sand says, you want me to follow Paul Blart? Yes, I want you to follow Paul Blart. I like Paul Blart. I think that's a guilty pleasure, funny movie. <laughs> uh, Frank Greger says, D Dave, could you see, uh, could you say that recipe again in your best Julia Child's voice? Re my recipe, what, 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 what recipe, Frank? Julia Child, how does she say, doesn't she sound like this, I'm Julia Child? Something like that, isn't it? What, 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 what recipe are you guys talking about? Or Frank talking about, Neil Rook sends a su uh, super chat, says, Dave, what's your top five cities you've been to? Top five cities I've been to. Well, I haven't, I've never traveled overseas, so I've never been out of North America. Uh, I know blasphemy. I know. I know. Really. I, 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 I want to go to, I got to get to Europe because I mean, obviously I'm half English. I mean, my mother was born in England, right? I have a, uh, English heritage, uh, there and I still have family there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I, I definitely want to get over there and see, you know, England and, and kind of, you know, putter around. And, and I, and I have an uncle 
my mom's brother who lives in Italy. Who, yeah, who lives in Italy. He's like an hour outside of Rome. No excuses, no excuses. Um, but here, I would say in Canada, I would say, well, it's, you know, Toronto. That's not really fair because, you know, I live here, but it's a great city. Um, and New York, I've been to New York, Chris, that's fantastic. LA, I've been to Los Angeles, that's fantastic. Um, Vancouver is great, you know. Um, been to Chicago. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say it, it sounds like a cop-out because I, I haven't traveled a lot, you know, and it almost seems like it's a cop-out to say Toronto, New York, LA. I mean, they're, they're, they're so like, they're staples. Who Who's not going to include that on a list if they've been to them, right? You know, I know you kind of maybe were hoping for a more obscure list like, well, Amsterdam, uh, you know, how about... Uh, Iceland, the the what's what's the capital of Iceland? Ra Ravagic or Ravik, Rajajik or whatever it is. You know, I mean, it sounds. I sound more cultured, right? If I start, you know, if I start making all these, you know, oh really? You've been to Iceland, have you? <laughs> no, I haven't. I haven't been there. So I would say, yeah, I, I would say that you know, Toronto, New York, L.A., maybe Montreal over Vancouver. Although Vancouver's got be Rajavik. That's it. Ray Rajavik. Rajavik. Although Vancouver's got the beautiful scenery and the mountains. So maybe Vancouver edges out Montreal because of its scenery, but Montreal might edge out Vancouver because of its culture, history too. Yeah, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Tough one. But I, I, I got to travel more, man. I got to travel more. Uh, Frank, yeah. What did, did Frank follow up with, with what he was talking about in terms of the recipe, or am I just completely having a brain fart now to lunch? Which is entirely possible, ladies and gentlemen. Entirely possible. Uh, Jonathan Nichols says, uh, maybe this is blasphemy, but Kevin James has just a little bit of John Candy in him. No, I think that's fair. I, I think it's fair to see parallels. They're both big guys, right? And they both... Um, I think John Candy, though, what, what Kevin James... I'm not saying Kevin James doesn't have this... But I think what Kevin James, we've yet to see from Kevin James, is the heart, the, the vulnerability. We've, we've yet to see a real vulnerability in any of the characters that Kevin James plays. Now, I think, you know, the most vulnerable you could point to would be like Paul Blart. You know, there's a, he's just a guy, you know, but it's not, it's, that's not really what's going on there, right? I mean, if that's the most you can point to, then we haven't seen any vulnerability. With John Candy, you saw it. You saw it in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. I mean, my God, what a performance, you know, at the end of that movie. You saw it in Uncle Buck. You know, you even saw it in, in films like, you know, um, oh, I mean, you even saw it in, in um, um, the first vacation film, even a little bit. You know, he was playing a little bit of a character then, but you saw it there. You saw it in, um, you saw, John Candy had, yeah, there was a, there was a, John Candy was, I understand the comparisons because they're both big guys, they're both funny, but Candy had the vulnerability. Candy had the innocence. Candy had the innocence. And the ability. And, the abil and that doesn't mean that Kevin James doesn't. He, he's a fine actor. There's nothing wrong with him. But he hasn't done that role yet. You know, um, he hasn't done that role yet. And, and I, I don't gather he will, you know. He's just a different type of comedian. Um, but I do get what you're saying, right? Like you could say the same thing about like a Melissa McCarthy, you know what I mean? Oh, they're both big, you know, and they both have that, you know, um, I actually, you know what? And I, I, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I am an unabashed Melissa McCarthy fan. I think she's terrific. You know, that doesn't mean that there are not certain movies she's done that were not very good, that I think she should maybe move away from her director husband. I don't think Ben Falcone, I think is his name, her real life husband who cameos in every movie she's in, he also directed Life of the Party and Tammy. I don't particularly, th th those are not strong movies. Uh, there, there, there are moments that are funny, 
But I think she's, you know, again, I can see the parallels, right? But Melissa McCarthy, I think, is a great actor. And I think Kevin James is a good actor, too. And I really liked uh, the movie she was in where she was nominated for her um, Academy Award, where she played that writer, that, 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 you know, that fraudulent writer that was stealing other people's work. Um, great movie. Uh, and I, lo I love her. I, I loved her in Identity Thief, Bridesmaids, Spy. You know, um, I loved her in The Heat. I think she's fucking funny. And I think I, I just don't, I don't get the hate. I really don't get the hate. You know, I think she's terrific. And she makes me laugh. And uh, and it's great to see her branching out and doing more serious things as well. So anyway, we'll go for another five minutes. Another five minutes, then we'll call it a show here on this episode 50. What are we up to? 55 now it is? Yeah, 55. Hard to believe. 55 episodes, ladies and germs. Tab of the Short says, I like the heat with Sandra Bullock. Yeah, I do too. I do too. I think that's funny. That's a funny movie. Um, I don't know she continues to do. Oh, and you know what? I actually didn't mind her in The Boss. That was. Did Ben Falcone. Did he direct that as well? Did he direct that as well? I know. I know. I know what Tablet's thinking. Dave's using Google again when he has a Google Assistant right behind him. I know. It's it's habit. It's habit. I'm so sorry, Tabitha. I'll work on it. It's just habit. Um, let me go back here. Uh, the Boss. Uh, da, 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 da. was that Ben Falcone? It was Ben Falcone. Okay, out of all the Ben Falcone directed movies, which is her real life husband, uh, that she's been in, I would probably say The Boss is the best one. Now, that's not saying much, you know, because you have The Boss, you have Life of the Party, and Tammy. Tammy's garbage. Tammy, I mean, there's funny moments, but Tammy's not very good. Uh, the Boss is... And then Life of the Party is better than Tammy, but I think it's weaker than The Boss. But Spy is great. The Heat is great. Identity Thief, I think, is funny. Um, Bridesmaids is great. You know, what does she got coming up? Thunder Force. Thunder Force, that sounds like a fucking comedy, and it's in post-production. The plot is being kept under wraps, but it's directed by her husband again, Ben Falcone. You know, but you know what? Hey, oh my God, there's set photos and they're dressed in, they're dressed in some funny shit. <laughs> this, this, this might be funny. This might be funny. It, it stars uh, Octavia Spencer and Melissa McCarthy, Thunder Force, and they're dressed in like this, like superhero outfits or something. I don't know, but it's, but it's directed by Ben Falcone. I, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. Um, Super intelligence is completed as well. Is that Ben? That's Ben Falcone too. Fuck, she loves working with her husband. You know what? I mean, it's sweet, right? And they're 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 millionaires. I mean, they don't care. You know who cares? But and maybe Ben Falcone. Maybe he's just. Maybe there's going to be a movie where there's going to surprise us. You know, but I just I haven't been a fan of his movies. But Super Intelligence is coming out, which sounds like a, I think it's a comedy as well. I think it's got to be. Carol Peters, which has got to be M Melissa McCarthy, yeah. Carol Peters' life is turned upside down when she is selected for observation by the world's first super intelligence, a form of artificial intelligence that may or may not take over the world. Yeah, all right. You know, Melissa McCarthy, James Corden is in it. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. It's hit and miss. More hit or... or more miss than hit. I would love to see her team up with um, what's his face again, because I think he's talented. Uh, ch -ch 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 Paul Feig. Paul Feig, of course, did Spy, did Bridesmaids. Spy is arguably her best comedy that she's done. Oh, and Paul Feig also did The Heat as well, which is arguably probably the next best one. And you can interchange The Heat and Spy. Like those are those are those are good funny movies, you know. So. And he did Bridesmaids as well. So I would like to see her maybe team up with... with uh, he did Ghostbusters as well. And I thought Ghostbusters was fine. It wasn't the original. But I thought, all things considered, I don't think the 2016 Ghostbusters movie is the disaster that people think it was or want it to be. I think on its own, it's fine. It's fine. I don't need to see another one, but it's fine. It's fine for what it is. Um, and she was fine in it. But anyway, yeah, I'm a big Melissa McCarthy fan. Okay, all right, a couple more, a couple more. Let's keep going, let's keep going. Ba -da -da -ba -ba -ba. Darren Sand says, Zookeeper is up there with blazing saddles. 
<laughs> We're talking about Kevin James zoo, uh, zookeeper. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Um, Alexander Dirksen says, Alexander Dirksen says, uh, my top five Harrison Ford movies are Blade Runner, Empire, Temple of Doom, The Fugitive, and the and the fugitive, I guess is what you're trying to say. Yeah. Blade Runner is my favorite film of all time. Love him. Gonna be sad when he dies. Yep, I agree. Let's hope he got another 10 years, man. Let's hope. But he's gonna be 78 this July. <sighs> kind of crazy stuff. Kind of crazy stuff. Uh let me see. Oliver Mercer says, Cool Runnings is brilliant. He does have a small cameo in career opportunities with Jennifer Connolly. Is that what you're trying to say? Opportunities? Does he have a small cameo in that? I've never seen that movie. Never seen that movie. Uh, let's see. Corey Dean says top five John Candy movies. Oh, it's coming. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm doing. I I am. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And again, I always tackle it like. Uh, I always tackle these things from certain points of view, right? So like we could do what pop culture says are John Candy's top five movies, but are they really his top five movies or would they be my top five John Candy movies? I always like to kind of personalize it a little bit while still trying to be objective. You know what I mean? Kind of, kind of, you know, have that bit of a, uh, uh, interesting take there. And naturally, of course, there's always going to be a pop culture John Candy film that winds up in there. You know, I mean, how do you do a top five candy movies and not have Uncle Buck? You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, it's not possible. So, but there are some candy movies that people don't really think of. Like, oh, I don't know, who's Harry Crumb? Who tends to think of that? Not many people. Delirious. Only the Lonely. Oh my God. Great John Candy movies. Only the Lonely better is better than uh, Delirious. But yeah, he had a sweetness. John Candy had a sweetness and an innocence, a vulnerability that was totally believable. Totally believable. I miss that man. Great Canadian. Great Canadian and gone far too soon. Far too soon. Uh, all right, folks. Listen, that is going to do it for me on episode 55 of McRae Live. I want to thank everybody who has tuned in all the questions. As usual, if I didn't get to your questions, it's nothing personal. It's just, you know, they're flying by. And you know me, I, you know, I talk and I like to be thorough with my answers. But I really appreciate everybody who tuned in. And I, of course, appreciate the Super Chats as well. It keeps this channel going and keeps these shows going. And yes, I have a new kind of lighting setup. This is the preliminary kind of uh, uh, setup. I'm, set I'm just testing this out. I have ordered new lights, which the Super Chats have paid for, and that's what's so great about uh, raising money through the channel is that it goes right back into the channel, and uh, I, I am just waiting for them to arrive. So I will be able to kind of set up a different kind of, you know, look for the background, just kind of make it, you know, just accent the background, you know, make me pop a bit more, kind of maybe at front, um, up front, I should say, because, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with the lighting setup that I have, but I found that it was just, you know, kind of plain, little uniform. I want to spice it up a little bit and maybe we can make it festive. So at like Halloween time, I can set up the background as like all orange and shit. <laughs> at Christmas time, make it all like red and green or something like that. You know, just kind of have some fun, have some fun. You guys are amazing. Thank you for tuning in. I, I will be back tomorrow at 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time for episode 56 of McRae Live. What am I going to be talking about? I don't know. You'll have to uh, tune in to find out. <laughs> All right, you guys are amazing. In the meantime, in between time, I will talk to you guys soon. Cheers.